Buongiorno. Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti. Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Di presentazione della mostra. We are here to make a presentation of the exhibition Cosa mai vista, things that were never seen. 400 years. 400 years ago, as we were saying, distinguished members of the Republic of Venice climbed to on top of the um, Tower Bell in Venice to prove how the telescope would work. This telescope would be disseminated throughout Europe and had, as Galileo had perfected it in his uh, laboratory in Padua. By the way, over the past few months, uh, uh, um, celebration has been organized uh, to uh, recall again this event. A few weeks after that, Galileo aimed his telescope towards the heavens at night and in the following months he would uh, um, see a succession of events that would upset uh, science and his very life. Uh, indeed, Galileo would describe uh, the, um, uh, uh, these things, uh, thanks to God, uh, I, myself, and uh, I, I was the only one to witness things that are, that are so um, bewildering and that have been kept a secret for so long. So he experienced something unique, including all the typical elements of a scientific adventure the one that are accompanied by endeavor, the one that are um, accompanied by uh, excitement. And he met up with uh, opposition, uh, um, mutual um, and tragic un misunderstanding with the church, as John Pope II uh, uh, stated. And uh, yet Galileo would always consider himself uh, as an obedient son. In a meeting such as this, in the exhibition that we are here to present, despite it being as wide as possible, well, of course, we cannot tackle uh, the whole range of problems and showing from this. But there are a number of um, ideas we can shed light on. Aiming our own telescope, the telescope of culture, adopting the approach that this meeting is um, suggesting, i.e. living the experience uh, of Galileo. So we're going to do as much together with Professor Ewan uh, Gingrich, whom we would like to thank. We would like indeed to thank him for accepting our invitation to come here, to come here from America. And we're going to talk uh, about the same things also with Professor Paolo Ponzio, who is very much familiar to this audience. Professor Gingert is a professor emeritus of astronomy and history of science at the Harvard University. He's also an astronomer at the, the Smithsonian uh, Observatory. He's one of the top authority in the history of science. Uh, so far as Galileo is concerned, he has translated and published uh, many books and papers. I'd like to refer now more specifically to uh, the work he carried out on Copernicus that is the result of uh, um, very accurate investigation that uh, took him over 30 years. He also dealt with the relationship between science and other forms of knowledge. Indeed, two years ago, he published uh, an essay that was also translated into Italian, uh, Looking for God in the Universe. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm going to speak today about the astonishing discoveries of Galileo, and I am going to begin in Padua, where he was born, where he was educated, where he became an assistant professor, at the university. And so I show you this wonderful landmark in uh, Pisa, which you immediately recognize. And I'm going to consider dropping some weights from the tower. As Galileo may have done, we're not sure, 
he was enough of a showman that I suppose he would have wanted to do this. But let us suppose we drop a heavy weight, an apple, from the tower, and we drop a feather from the tower. Now, Aristotle would tell you that the heavy one is going to drop much faster. And I think you will agree that the apple will fall well before the uh, feather. So let's let them fall. Oh, you see indeed that, as Aristotle says, the heavy one goes down the fastest. This is the world of Aristotle, which is very much based on common sense. But science tends to abstract things to examine the details. And so I want to ask again about dropping weights from this tower. Galileo didn't need to drop the weights because he could work on this logically. And he asks the following question. What would happen if we tied the weights together? Now the light weight, which goes slower, should hold back the heavy weight and make it fall slower. But wait a minute. If we tie the two together, they are now heavier so they should drop faster. So we have a paradox. How can it be that they will fall slower and faster both? And the only way is to suppose that they will fall together. And that is the generalization of Galileo. And it's one of the important findings which paves the way for a whole new mechanics which is taken up eventually by Isaac Newton, who found that Galileo was a great hero, one of the giants on whose shoulders he stood for doing his own work. I'd like to show you another image from Pisa. This is in the Campo Santo, the burial house, and it is a wonderful diagram Cosmographia of Piero de Puccio, uh, done at the end of the 14th century. Unfortunately, it was very much destroyed in World War II, but it has been pieced together by the archaeologists and art historians. And you can see a medieval view of the cosmos, with the Earth solidly placed in the center, surrounded by the spheres of water, of air, and fire, and then the spheres of the planets, the moon first, Mercury, Venus, the sun, and so on, and God outside it uh, with the angels and the elect, a very tidy form of the universe. You can see it printed here in 1492 in the Nuremberg Chronicle. Uh, and again, you see the earth fixed in the middle and the various spheres of the heavens. So this was a universe that people were very comfortable with, and it was one that had a uh, very great challenge given by the work of Nicholas Copernicus. So here we go to Frauenberg in northern Poland to the cathedral where Copernicus was a canon. He was a legal officer of this cathedral and a physician. Uh, so he was in charge of uh, many of the affairs. Recently, the archeologists have excavated the unmarked grave of Copernicus. Uh, they found a skull and bones of a 70-year-old man, the age when Copernicus died, and also the very time when he published his great book. The picture you see is a reconstruction of the elderly Copernicus at the time he died. 
Here is a page from the beginning of the book. He received these final pages on the last day of his life, and he probably was not well enough to appreciate exactly what it said. But it starts in Latin, non dubito. No doubt, you have heard about the hypotheses in this work and are afraid that all of liberal arts is about to be thrown into confusion. But don't worry. It is the job of an astronomer to make careful observations and then to make hypotheses to explain them so that you can calculate the positions of the planets at any time past or future. And this our author has done admirably, but these hypotheses need not be true, nor even probable. This is not what Copernicus wrote, and it was probably not what he believed. But it protected the book from criticism for many decades, because in the 16th century, this book was seen as a cookbook, a recipe book, for calculating the positions of the planets, and you didn't have to worry about the fact that Copernicus was placing the sun and not the earth in the middle of his universe. And the earth was going around the sun at very great speed. Let me show you the path to his system. Here we can see an earth-centered universe, that's the blue dot, and if you want to show the motion of a planet in its circle, you had to have an auxiliary circle or an epicycle to account for the occasional backward motion of the planets. How to calculate the position of the planet? First, you would draw the line uh, to the planet in the epicycle, and it's very important to notice that for the major planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, that that line in the epicycle is always exactly parallel to the line from the Earth to the Sun. If you draw the line from the Earth to the planet, and, uh, sorry, to the epicycle, and then from the center of the epicycle to the planet, it is this blue line that you're concerned about. That is the direction of the planet from the Earth. But now there's another way to get that blue line. The distance to the sun, the size of that circle, is completely arbitrary. So we can rescale it and still have the direction to the sun and complete the parallelogram in a different way. Now we can still compute that blue line, the direction to the planet. Now, let us do a major transformation. And instead of having the Earth as the center, we move it so that the sun becomes the center. The geometry to the planet is still the same, but we no longer need the epicycle, nor those other lines. We can calculate it directly from the Earth to the Sun to the planet. Essentially, Copernicus has invented the solar system. He has made the Earth a planet going around the Sun. It's wonderful. It's a computational aid. But Copernicus has found out something else. What he discovers is that when he makes this arrangement, the planets all fall in a very natural way so that Mercury, which goes around the sun the fastest, automatically falls at the center closest to the sun. Venus is next, the Earth and Moon, which go around in a year, that's next, and finally you go out to the most lethargic, lazy planet Saturn, which takes about 30 years to go around. 
it's all arranged in this beautiful way. The aesthetics were compelling for Copernicus. In no other arrangement do we find such a uh, interesting connection between the size of the orbit and its period. There were very few people who appreciated this aesthetic, but one of them was our friend Galileo Galilei. But he was a timid Copernican. He was still teaching the ancient geocentric astronomy in his new teaching position in Padua. And for many years, he taught the ancient Ptolemaic system. But then in 1609, 400 years ago, something wonderful happened that completely changed him from a timid Copernican to an enthusiastic Copernican. He heard about the Dutch invention of a spyglass that made it possible to see distant objects as if they were much more close. He may have seen such a telescope, but while it didn't have that name yet, it wouldn't get the name until 1611, but uh, nevertheless, he figured out how to do it. He made many telescopes which were presented to the royal heads of Europe. Uh, many of these were sent out, but amazingly, only two authentic examples remain, which are seen here in a picture from the History of Science Museum in Florence. And below the two telescopes, you can see uh, in that ivory carved uh, decorative piece, the broken lens of the telescope with which Galileo made his important discoveries of the nature of the moon and the satellites of Saturn, uh, sorry, of Jupiter. One of those telescopes is currently on exhibition in the Strozzi Palazzo in Florence, and the other one has been lent temporarily to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, in America, where it is currently on display. And the first thing you notice about it is that in front of the main lens, there is a paper diaphragm that restricts the opening. You may think, this is astonishing. Why does he cut down the light gathering power of this instrument? But this was the secret of Galileo's success. The lenses were so terrible in those days that if you didn't block off the outer, poorer part of the lens, you probably wouldn't see anything very easily. So by putting the diaphragm on, it became possible for him to get a sharp view of the astronomical objects. And as far as we can tell, these are the first two drawings that Galileo made of the moon. You can see that the one to your left is a little bit strange in the separation of light and darkness. The moon doesn't have that shape. How could Galileo have gone so wrong? Well, the reason is that his telescope had an extremely narrow field of view. He could only see part of the moon at one time. And what he saw were those little dots of light lying outside of the main bright area in the darkness. Galileo had enough training as an artist to immediately understand that those were the peaks of mountains which were just catching the light of the sun as it was rising across the surface of the moon. I think in Galileo's enthusiasm for what he saw was that he put too many in. But there they are, and immediately 
after seeing the results, he started over again to make a second image, much more accurate in the shape of the moon. I have looked carefully at the drawings. They're preserved in the National Library in Florence to see if he had a guideline uh, on the, this, what we call the terminator, the place that separates the light part and the dark part of the moon. But I couldn't see any guideline. He just did it with great accuracy and again shows many of those little dots of light. In all, he was able to produce in, uh, at the end of November and December of 1609 this wonderful panel of, of moon drawings. I think that maybe the one in the middle of the right-hand side may have been made in January. It's a, a little difficult to be absolutely certain because he didn't date them. I want to show you particularly the drawing at the bottom of the right-hand column, and we'll look at it with a little more detail. Because you can see near the top of this drawing these two long uh, projections that go out into the darkness. Those are the rings of mountains which sur surround one of those flat areas which has been given the name Mare Serenitatis, that is, the Sea of Serenity. And here is a photograph taken of the moon at this time, and you can see those uh, mountains going out into the darkness. The terminator, the position of light and dark, is moving constantly across the surface of the moon. But Galileo could observe this crescent moon from Padua for only about four hours before the moon set. And then, as the terminator continued to move across uh, enlarging the crescent moon, it was seen from different geographical longitudes. It was not until uh, 24 hours later when it was possible to see a different part of the moon. The exact part of the moon seen, in other words, can give us an exact date when Galileo made the observations. A month earlier and a month later, this would not be seen. It would be seen on the opposite side of the Earth because it takes 29 and a half days for the moon to go through this cycle, and that half day means that this particular view would be seen uh, from a different part of the Earth. Now, Galileo is interested to publish this in his book, The Sidereus Nuncius. But let's look at the drawing in the book. You will notice something has happened. Galileo has moved the Terminator to show you the quarter moon, exactly dividing the two parts of light and dark. But that's an impossibility because Mare Serenitatis, which you can see on this map of the moon in the upper part, is only in this uh, eastern half and uh, not bridging the dividing line between them. So what is Galileo doing? Well, Galileo is not interested in cartography, in mapping the moon exactly. He is interested in topography, the heights and depths, the idea that the moon is Earth-like. It has mountains, it has valleys, smooth places, and places full of craters. In fact, this is a very anti-Aristotelian document because it is showing that the moon actually is much more Earth-like than had been imagined by uh, Aristotle and the ancients. I now move to the next month, to January, and I want to show you 
what I consider to be the most exciting single manuscript page in the history of astronomy. These are Galileo's notes showing what he was observing around the planet Jupiter. On the night of January the 7th, 1610, Jupiter was very close to the moon. Probably Galileo was looking at the moon and easily turned his telescope to the planet and was amazed by what he saw. Namely, he saw uh, two tiny, uh, th three little moons, uh, one on each side, uh, sorry, two on one side and one on the other. And then he said on the next night, uh, f guided by what fates he knew not, he went out and looked again and saw the same dots of light but arranged differently. And he was puzzled because he thought he knew which way Jupiter was moving and it seemed wrong. So he came out and looked again the next night. Oh no, it was cloudy. So. The next night, on January, sorry, yes, on January the 10th, he looked again, and he saw only two, one of them perhaps hidden by the planet. Now he became very serious about this. I think he hadn't written any notes about it, but from memory, he wrote it all down, what he had seen on those days. But on January 11th, you will see that he writes much more detail about what he is seeing. And let's go on to the bottom of the page where uh, on January 13th, he looks and to his amazement, he sees not three, but four little uh, spots of light. At first, he supposed they were little stars, but by now, he has begun to realize that these are moons, little planets going with the planet Jupiter. And he realizes that he has a wonderful discovery for telling the world. And something strange happens. On this side of the sheet, everything is written in Italian. But when he turns the sheet over, everything continues in Latin. Why? Because Latin was the international language of science and he knew he had something to say to scientists, learned people all over Europe. He rushes his book, manuscript, over to Venice to be set into type. He doesn't even know yet the name of his book. He calls it the Astronomicus Nuncius, the astronomical messenger. But he knows that he has a naming opportunity. He is going to name these new little planets after Cosimo de' Medici down in Florence. This book is a job application. He desperately wants the job in the Florentine court to leave Padua where he is tired of having to earn his living by tutoring students, by running a workshop to make instruments and so on. You will see the red arrow. It is pointing to his discovery. He is going to call them the Cosmican uh, planets. And he writes a letter, rather belatedly, to the private secretary of Cosmo de Medici, who says, that won't do. If you call them Cosmican planets, everybody will assume you mean cosmic planets and they won't get it. So you really must call them the Medicean planets. That part of the book had already been printed. So they had to work very hard. Now watch closely where that arrow is and you will see what has happened. In all of the copies of the book, they had to paste over it a little slip of paper to change it to the Medicean planets. What can I say? It was successful. He got the job 
and he moved to Florence. Now I think Galileo really liked his sleep. He didn't like to get up too early before dawn. And so he failed to look at the next brightest object in the nighttime sky, Venus, because it was seen only in the morning. But by the time he arrived in Florence, Venus had moved to the evening sky. And this now made possible a very interesting cosmological test. Because in the ancient system, the geocentric system, which you see on the left-hand side, Venus moves in an epicycle which is always locked directly between the Earth and the Sun. If Venus shines by reflected light, you all only would see mostly the backside, just a crescent. In the Copernican system, which I've shown on the right-hand screen, part of it, Venus moves around the Sun. So if it shines by reflected light, it would show the entire set of phases just like the moon. Well, when Galileo got out his telescope to look at Venus in the evening sky, Venus was very small and fuzzy. You can see how much smaller it appeared than Jupiter did in his telescope. Jupiter is very large in comparison, and for Venus, it was hardly worth looking at. But by the de beginning of December in 1610, it was beginning to change. Galileo was very excited. He thought he maybe had another great discovery, and he waited until January the 1st before announcing this discovery because then he was sure that Venus had all of the phases and that Venus went around the sun. Had he proved the Copernican system? Well, unfortunately not. Here you see the frontispiece of the book by the Jesuit Riccioli, and there is Ptolemy down at the bottom rejected because his system won't do. But the Copernican system does not hang the most heavily in the balance of Urania. The heaviest one is the system which was made by Tycho Brahe, in which the Earth was fixed solidly in the middle, and the Earth was uh, carried around the, uh, sorry, the Earth was fixed in the middle, the Sun was carried around the Earth just as the moon was, the two great luminaries going around the Earth. But the sun carried around it Mercury and Venus, and thereby Venus had the full set of phases. So you may often hear now that with the telescope, Galileo had proved the Copernican system wrong. He had made the Copernican system more reasonable, but he hadn't proved it. Soon he made another great discovery, that the sun had spots on it. Again, the sun was not perfect the way it had been supposed by the ancients. You'll notice the delicate drawings of the sunspots and how they change from one day to the next and we can continue the sequence, uh, and you can see from the appearance of these sunspots, Galileo was sure they were on the surface of the sun. And this was shocking to the traditionalists to imagine that the sun, too, was spotted and blemished. Galileo now became an enthusiastic Copernican. And he even ha dropped some hints. You know, the Copernican system seemed really crazy to people. If the Earth is spinning around on its axis every 24 hours, why don't people fly off into space? And how can the Earth go around the sun and keep the moon with it? Why doesn't the moon get lost? 
So as Galileo said, but look, everybody agrees that Jupiter is moving, and yet Jupiter carries its four little moons with it as it goes in its great cycle around the sun. If Jupiter can do it, surely the Earth can do it. He couldn't explain why, but it suddenly made it more reasonable to think that maybe the Earth is moving. And why people don't fly off? Now that would remain for Isaac Newton to work out. Galileo went to Rome. He wanted to persuade the authorities in the church not to come down on a particular cosmological system. Leave the door open in case more evidence comes for the Copernican system. He was told that this wouldn't do, and in particular, they were irritated that Galileo had written, although he hadn't published it, a letter to Cosmo's mother, the Grand Duchess Christina, explaining some things about Holy Scripture, that it would speak in the language of the common man. It was not a scientific textbook. You had to speak even as a Copernican would do of the sunrise and the sunset. But this was only apparent to the eyes. There might be more there than you could understand. And Galileo was told that won't do for you to write on these theological matters. You're not a theologian, and we have to maintain a constant uh, view of these things because those damned Lutherans north of the Alps are interpreting scripture the own, their own way, letting anybody do it. We don't want amateur theologians rocking the boat. And so Galileo was silenced on these matters until a new pope came to the throne, a fellow Florentine, somebody he knew, who became Pope Urban VIII. And he talked with Urban, and he thought he had permission to write a book on cosmology. I suspect that Urban expected a very dry treatise uh, with geometry of different world systems in. He probably did not expect this book written in the vernacular Italian as a lively dialogue in which the uh, Aristotelian uh, commentator was over and over defeated in the arguments by uh, 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 by the spokesman for Galileo's own views. So Galileo got into a lot of trouble. That's not part of what I really want to talk to you about, but I couldn't leave the Galileo story alone without at least saying something about it. So here I was in the Vatican archives with a group of astronomers. I said, aren't you going to show us the papers? from the Galileo trial, and strangely enough, it hadn't occurred to them to show us the thing we were most interested in. So suddenly they brought out the book and thrust it into my hands to show what I wanted to show. And what could I show? Well, I picked this page of testimony where Galileo was vehemently suspected of heresy and was to be shown, possibly shown, the instruments of torture. I've underlined the word tortua in the manuscript there. As far as we know, he was never shown the instruments of torture, definitely never tortured. He was too old for the regulations. It was probably a mistake on the part of the Vatican, not at the time of the Inquisition and Galileo's trial, but already in 1516 when a group of non-specialists had declared uh, the Copernican system erroneous and part of it formally heretical. Uh, a, a mistaken opinion 
which of course has been uh, overcome in recent times. Now, would you believe that I was actually speaking to uh, Pope John Paul II about Galileo? And uh, some of my friends say, since I'm the one with the open mouth, that this was the Pope having an audience with me. But uh, uh, in any event, uh, the, uh, it was an interesting statement that was made, made by the Pope that Galileo was ironically the better theologian than the ones he was contending with. That when Galileo said the Bible teaches how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. That statement was one that Pope John Paul II uh, indicated that he approved of. So that is the story, but let me give some conclusion. Galileo did not prove the motion of the earth but or the Copernican system, but he made it intellectually more respectable, and in that way, he changed the way of doing science because he essentially told us that science works not by proofs, but by persuasion. And by making a reasonably coherent system, it brought about the acceptance of the Copernican system. When the physical proofs were finally produced in the 19th century, there was not dancing in the streets because finally the Copernican system had been proved. It was long since accepted because it made sense. I end with this view from the opera of Galileo, published after Galileo's death. Galileo is shown presenting his telescope to the muses and pointing up to the coat of arms of the Medici family, which is six spheres arranged in a hexagon. But these are very special spheres. The top one is Jupiter, with its four moons going around it. And the others are other are the moon and other planets that Galileo observed in his telescope. It may be that Galileo fell into disfavor, but uh, in the end, Galileo had won and had made the Copernican system intellectually respectable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jindrick, for this presentation that enabled us uh, to re-experience this event of uh, uh, scientific knowledge and even better to understand what we are exhibiting in this uh, show, in this exposition, exhibition devoted to uh, Galileo. Now I'd like to give the floor to Professor Paolo Ponzio, who has a chair of philosophy at the Bar University. He has been dealing on the debate of uh, science, philosophy and theology as uh, took place on Galileo. He published different papers and books, one on Copernicanism, and um, he also wrote on Campanella Galilei and Foscari. Professor Pontius, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bergantini. And thank you, Professor Gingrich, who made my job much easier. On January the 7th, 1610, and please uh, follow my slide, uh, better to understand uh, the language by Galileo. Anyone will then understand uh, 
with the certainty of uh, the senses that the moon is by no means endowed with a smooth and polished surface, but it is uh, rough and uneven, and uh, just as the face of the Earth itself is crowded everywhere with vast prominences, deep chasms, and convolutions. So much so that you can say that, again, the um, moon is um, characterized by even bigger prominences and chasms um, with respect to the Earth. This is how one of the first uh, treaties by Galileo starts off, one of, his, one of his first reports. Indeed, this was a letter that he wrote on January the 7th, 1610. And uh, this is a letter addressed to Antonio de' Medici, a cousin of Cosimo II, so a, cos, a cousin of the Grand Duke of uh, Tuscany. The same letter was also addressed to Cristoforo Clavio, a Jesuit mathematician, uh, Cristoforo Clavius um, being uh, um, held the young scientist uh, from Pisa in high esteem, as Galileo would always uh, share with uh, um, him his findings. And Galileo outlines uh, swiftly and accurately the findings that he arrived at with the using of the telescope, uh, but uh, e depressions, uh, elevations, uh, prominences, uh, chasms, uh, the study of the moon phases, and uh, the discovery of the first three of the four um, planets of Jupiter. This by itself uh, would lead to the whole collapse of the whole cosmology of the ancient times. It would even uh, jopalize uh, the cosmology by Aristotle uh, and uh, Ptolemaic based on which the whole knowledge of the universe was based. And Galileo knew that full well. He knew that he had to devise uh, um, strategies to disseminate his findings to become famous and to make sure to keep such dissemination under control so as to make sure that it would be uh, clearly understood by the scientists of his uh, times. And above all, Galileo knew full well that his discoveries would have uh, had uh, wide-ranging and revolutionary consequences. And this is um, the public account that he would entitle Siderius Nuntus, uh, The Starry Message. No doubt, no doubt, big things in this short treatise I offer to the observation and contemplation of those studying nature. Big things because of the very excellences of the things I deal with and because the innovation, the un never heard before uh, innovation that I'm going to refer to, these things are indeed uh, great also because of the tool that uh, made the thing these things um, uh, um, visible. There's a great bewilderment indeed when faced with the observation of the heavens. Galileo knows that his discoveries are thoroughly exceptional, knows that they are totally unforeseen, that they certainly account for a true event, so much so that uh, what he has recorded during those uh, cold and damp nights in the winter of Padua is undeniable. And indeed, uh, writing to Belisario Vinta, the Secretary of State of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, uh, um, he writes the following. I thank uh, lo the Lord for he was so good as to make my, me and just myself as the first observer of uh, such um, wonders. Again, it is something totally unexpected that takes place in Galileo's life. It is something totally, again, unforeseeing, uh, shedding new light on his experience uh, as a mathematician. We may even say that all the interest toward um, astronomic research, again, uh, takes place totally unexpected, considering what any professor of mathematics would do uh, on, a routinely ba on a routine basis, as Professor Ginger just outlined. It is very likely that uh, when he was de developing his first um, spyglass, uh, making a gift to the Doge of Venice, um, Leonardo Donati, just 400 years ago, that is on August the 29th, 1609, so when building uh, this telescope, Galileo uh, was still unaware of what would happen in the next few months when the very same device would be aimed at the heavens. In this uh, letter to Belisario Vinta, indeed, uh, he wrote that uh, 
thanks to the telescope, uh, he would m become aware of the great innovations consider, uh, regarding uh, the luminaries. We do not know exactly when uh, his um, lenses, uh, his uh, telescope, his uh, spyglass would be aimed at the heavens. But sadly, he felt uh, greatly moved, uh, very much like uh, um, other scholars are experimenting nowadays uh, whenever they observe nature and they grasp some new phenomena, unexpected phenomena or event that take place in the history of human knowledge. As an important theologian and um, scholar says at the Yad Shaden, the history of natural science may be summed up as what you get to see with ever more perfect eyes in a world where there is always something new to see. Ever more perfect eyes and ever more accurate investigations. Reading through uh, the long list of letters that Galileo wrote during those years, uh, you can understand that there's a work in progress. As is the case when uh, a certain objective is achieved uh, and uh, you feel the need to go beyond that. A number of centuries before then, uh, St. Kay Augustine uh, would suggest that, uh, very much the same thing when he said that the process leading, leading to knowledge may never be interrupted. Augustine, indeed, uh, in their Trinitate, wrote, we carry out investigations, as is true of those uh, who carry out research because they still haven't found anything. And we uh, come across a discovery as um, they do those who are still searching for something because when you have achieved something, you know that you, can own, that you have only but started. And this is an attitude which is going to stay with Galileo up until when his health would, uh, will enable that. So, based on the observations included in the Siderius, he um, looked at Venus, Mars, Saturn, and most specifically, in two of his letters, dating um, both to uh, December the 30th, 1610, the first to Christophorus Clavius, and the second to his colleague and friend, Benedetto Castelli, Galileo talks for the first time about uh, Venus uh, and the uh, Mercury faces around the Sun. The very first faces that were um, identified distinctly, unlike the faces of Mercury um, that could not be um, seen as clearly with uh, the telescope that um, Galileo had at the time. At the end of that letter, especially to the, the one in to Castelli, he says, you made me laugh when you were saying that these findings will persuade the diehard. Perhaps you are not familiar with the fact that if you have to persuade a reasonable man who are willing to get to know the truth, my previous studies um, were already uh, persuasive. He was referring to the observations included in the Sidereus Nuntius. But to persuade the diehard, to persuade those who are just uh, looking to get uh, the approval of uh, the public at large, not even the stars uh, will be enough. Even if they should the star come down to Earth and uh, talk about their movement, uh, they wouldn't be persuasive. This means that those that uh, do not have reason will never be convinced, not even by the stars themselves. And this is why the scholars go on saying, goes on saying, we should try and carry out investigations for our own sake. We should be happy with what we find ourselves. But we certainly shouldn't hope we can, have, we can see a progress in the learning of the public. You can't remain neutral faced with the Galilee observations. So on the one hand, he, sa he sees the diehard, and on the other hand, he sees those who are capable of reason. As a matter of fact, Galileo has no doubts on the truthfulness of his findings and on the need to involve those who are willing to learn the truth. A few months after that, Galileo travels to Rome, the capital state of the Pontifical State. Indeed, he got there on March 29th of 1611. The next day, 
he goes to the um, to the Jesuit institutions uh, to meet his old friend Cristoforo Clavio and the other mathematic, uh, mathematicians and Jesuits. And this is what uh, Galileo writes uh, to the Secretary of State, Belisario Vinta, on the next day. I met uh, with the Jesuits. And I stayed at length with Father Clavio and with other two uh, fathers. And having got to know the truth about the new uh, Medician planet, these fathers uh, have uh, carried out observations and have been doing so for two months. And in a way, in a way their observations and my own observations fit, fit perfectly. This means that the mathematicians, the Jesuits at the Collegio Romano do own a telescope themselves and have already made the same observations that Galileo made, confirming the truth of all his findings. And yet Galileo knows perfectly well that he cannot measure the orbit as traced by the planets. And I quote, they are still trying to analyze the timing of that, such revolutions, of the revolutions of the planet. But I sincerely hope I will find them uh, out. And I trust in God, who was so good to um, help me discover so many wonders. And I believe that the, the Lord is going to be as good in um, helping me identify the order of the revolutions of the planet. So Kepler had uh, acknowledged the observation by Galileo, and now even the mathematicians and Jesuits would confirm uh, his findings. Furthermore, Galileo proved that the object of his findings and observations is to identify and reveal the um, order followed by the revolutions and uh, movement of all planets. Galileo's science, therefore, had to uh, aim at the truth. During the first journey to Rome in the spring of, nine, of 1611, Galileo got to know, meet, and establish a long-lasting relationship with some of the most important um, characters of the time. The Pope, Paul V himself, who met him in a private uh, hearing, and then the Duke of Aquascarpata, the Prince Federico Cesi, who invited him as a founding father to the Academia de Lince, the first scientific academy in Europe. He then met up with a number of priests and cardinals in Rome, Matteo Barberini, to become Urban VIII, as Professor Ginger just said. And then he met up with uh, Carlo Conti, Piero Dini, and Cardinal Bellamin. Let me dwell only briefly, if I may, on his relationship exactly with Bellamin, the Galileo and Bellamin relationship, which I deem as very interesting because of the future developments it led to. On April the 19th, 1611, after a private meeting, with Galileo, Bellamin asked the mathematicians of the Collegio Romano information on Galileo's new findings. Here's the letter of Bellamin. And Bellamin, I wish to uh, recall, was a Jesuit himself. At the time, he had important posts within different congregations of the Roman Church at this Sant'Uffizio, the uh, and then he was also uh, dealing with censorship uh, of um, books to be printed. His contemporaries uh, would refer to him as the porter of congregations because he was constantly um, uh, taking documents from one congregation to the other. And this is what he wrote. I know that um, you've heard about uh, the um, findings of uh, the mathematician who, through the use of the telescope or the spyglass, um, and I myself have seen wonderful things around the moon and Venus. And yet, I wish to learn from you what you think 
about the following things. In the Jesuit letter, there's apparently no uh, hostility whatsoever with reference to Galileo. The reason why he wrote the letter is to learn whether his findings were to be considered as uh, truthful. And what are the questions that Bellamin raised to uh, his colleagues, the mathematician? First, is it possible that there is a plethora of uh, fixed stars that are invisible to the naked eye? Second question, is it possible that such one is made up by three stars? Third question, is it possible for Venus to have phases just as the moon? Fourth question, is the moon's surface truly uneven, as uh, he maintains? F fifth question, can Jupiter actually have four planets uh, rotating around it? Even the very sequence of these questions doesn't seem um, coincidental. Indeed, the first question raised is to hear confirmation about the existence of a multiplicity, a plethora of stars and worlds. And this was the same uh, subject matter uh, that um, led to the condemnation of Giordano Bruno. Indeed, Bellamin was one who signed the condemnation, the sentence uh, to, uh, for Bruno. Bellamin played an important role in uh, fighting against uh, Giordano Bruno, the um, men blamed with heresy uh, coming from uh, Nola. Indeed, he had been confronted with uh, um, so diverse um, theories uh, um, that were considered as heresy. So, Bruno's presence certainly influenced uh, Bellamin action. And yet, uh, the cardinal, Bellamin, felt that there could be some uh, connection between these new findings of science and the scriptures. The mathematicians, Clavio, Grinberger, Melcourt, and Lembo, these are the four mathematicians making up the Collegio Romano at the time, answered to this letter on April 24th, confirming the truthfulness of all the uh, discoveries and findings as um, included in the Sidereus. And by the way, Bailamin um, disseminated the, the content of uh, the letter from the mathematicians uh, to the restricted circle of his friends, including, among the others, uh, Monsignor Piero Dini, who on May the 7th wrote in the letter that Cardinal Bellamin wrote a letter to the Jesuits asking information on some uh, um, items in the doctrine of Galileo and uh, such fathers confirmed thoroughly uh, Galileo's uh, findings and proved to be close friends of Galileo. So again, the Jesuits proved to be um, close friends of Galileo. This is the uh, consideration um, of a um, personal friend of Bellamin, uh, one of the more influential priests in Rome. And yet, we also know that uh, it is going to be Cardinal Bellamin a few years after that to um, scare away Galileo uh, from disseminating his Coper the Copernican doctrine. How come that Copernicanism uh, is um, banned in 1616? What are the factors at play leading again to the banning of Copernican theory? A number of philosophers and uh, theologians uh, um, who are closely connected to the uh, cosmological doctrines of based on Aristotle um, philosophy, prove some kind of aversion with reference uh, to the conclusions reached by the new astronomy, Galileo's astronomy. The problem that started off with the letter wrote by Galileo to Castelli in the December 1613, which is recalled by the scholars as the first Copernican letter, 
and which is then the subject of a uh, denunciation of Galileo to Santificio in 1615. Uh, the problem is that of fitting together scientific truth, indeed the object or, or the subject matter actually, the discoveries of Galileo, of his findings, and what was um, included in the Bible. How could you fit together the doctrine about the immobility of the sun with the movement of the earth with certain statements in the uh, Holy Scriptures? The earth um, is always in, never moves or the sentence um, based on which um, the sun should not move. Such questions may seem naive nowadays, and yet they were certainly not so for a scholar in the 17th century. For scholars at that time, the truth of natural uh, knowledge had to coincide with what included in the um, sacred scriptures. And as a matter of fact, Galileo himself thought exactly likewise. There's a per the two truths basically fit together perfectly because nature and writing may never go one against the other. Galileo, in uh, No Judge Down in 1615, wrote that Catholic astronomers will never prove the Holy Scriptures false. As a matter of fact, the Holy Scriptures fit perfectly with natural truths as proven and demonstrated. Galileo method, indeed, is very much based of never drawing the distinction between the scientific approach and the theological reflection of nature. The two things, the two way forwards, the two ways to uh, knowledge are both originated by the Word of God as he wrote to the letter, the Copernican letter, uh, addressed to uh, the Cristina di Lorena, the, um, grand, the Grand Duchess of uh, Tuscany. So theories can never go one against the other, despite that uh, making process in different modes. The Bible was dictated by the Holy Spirit, and as such, requires ongoing interpretation and uh, explanations, whereas nature is just implementing God's orders uh, and it doesn't need any additional explanations. This is very much the reason why Galileo could not accept the suggestions put forward by Bellarmine to present a Copernican just as an assumption. For Bellarmine, indeed, science, and astronomy more specifically, had just to be considered as an assumption because each natural event could have been uh, explained differently. And indeed, the Copernican system itself had to be considered just as an assumption, a potential uh, mathematical explanation of the universe. According to Galileo, astronomy is closely interrelated with natural history. There could be no fragmentation at the time between science and culture. And yet, this is a mistake that also theologians at the time made. Theologians uh, then believe that the, the structure of natural reality and uh, um, what the Bible would say to that respect corresponded perfectly. Theologians did not have those interpretive criteria to distinguish the holy um, scriptures for its interpretation, did not have the epistemological criteria. As a matter of fact, at the time, the lateral interpretation was laid too much emphasis on at the time. And this is why apparently between, between scientists and theologians there was some kind of short circuit. Theolo theologian, especially promoted by Bellamin, with the invitation to always consider the Copernican system as an assumption, but 
bears witness uh, to the um, scientific to the need to uh, um, to need for sticking to contemporary epistemo uh, epistemology. We may even say that in the case of Galileo, the situation has been changed dramatically in that Bellamin, uh, playing as a, um, a scientist, uh, is very right, as right as is right Galileo when uh, talking with his hat as a theologian. Anyway, Galileo may not be considered as a saint, as some maintained at the beginning of the 19th century. He may not even be considered as a martyr of free thinking, as other maintains uh, in uh, certain circles uh, nowadays. As John Pope II said in his formal statement to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences on October the 31st, 1992, under such point of view, the case of Galileo was very much the symbol of the alleged ban on the side of the church to scientific progress, or was also the symbol of dogmatic obscurantism as opposed to the free quest for truth. This myth played a very important role, culturally speaking, in that it contributed to con con to uh, persuade many men of science uh, in good faith to be considered that, uh, um, that it wasn't possible to follow science uh, and uh, to um, pursue research. In a way, Galileo caused some kind of uh, um, rupture. As the Pope said, certainly not bitting about the bush, um, he referred to Galileo as uh, an important cultural myth. And this myth is, um, fe um, is uh, fed on uh, the um, the opposition between science and faith. And this is the tragic and mutual misunderstanding. And certainly, John Paul II says something that cannot be denied, in that on the one side, he uh, states that it has been tragic. And I'd like to highlight the importance of this word. This has been a tragic mistake that theologians at the time uh, made in maintaining that a geocentric um, interpretation was confirmed by the only possible interpretation of the Bible that was the literal interpretation. On the other, uh, on the other side, John Paul II highlights that there was a very high um, interest at stake because some um, used Galileo as a pretext uh, uh, to see that there's always an opposition between science and faith, but the two things are never separated. They just adopt different methods, so much so that different aspects can be evidenced, uh, such aspect being um, closely related to one single reality. Such a change in science basically brought about a thorough change in the whole establishment of knowledge. Father Giussani uh, reminded as much from the point of view of religion. The use of reason requires um, uh, different procedures and methods. Indeed, the reason doesn't proceed with uh, one single method. It is indeed extremely flexible, uh, resilient, uh, and uh, uh, John Paul II highlighted the importance that it is very important uh, to um, make sure that each science uh, should uh, be um, better aware of uh, the rigorous method it has to follow. So 
we shan't forget that there is a need to put together the different knowledge, despite the different knowledges being pursued with different methods in different um, frameworks. Paradoxically, that is, each science uh, may contribute in uh, its own specialization, but we have to put them all together so as to arrive at a full integration of knowledge so that a unique and single culture of men and for men is arrived at. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie, professor Ponzio. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof Professor Ponzio, for making, uh, making that uh, tragic um, nature of the relationship between um, Galileo and uh, his uh, um, and the theologians of his time so uh, vivid. I believe that the contents of the exhibition are emerged quite clearly by uh, what the two speakers have already said, so I'm going to confine myself to add only a few things. The exhibition that has been cured by Eurysis um, uh, under the auspices of uh, the um, A cultural um, bodies. Um, so, as I was saying, we should try and uh, uh, grasp the great innovation in the method that was introduced by Galileo. Uh, certainly, he was part of a, a complex um, period in history. And also, we can try and draw some. Um, insights uh, from him for today's science. Uh, the exhibition uh, starts from uh, where the roots of this genius are to be located, pointing out that the genius uh, of uh, Galileo fits into a certain cultural uh, setting. His scientific activity takes place uh, on the background of a debate on the systems of the universe, on the models of the universe, which were more varied than expected. The Professor Gingerick also showed us that there was also a Tycho Brahe's model apart from the Ptolemaic and Copernican model. The, these models uh, are not uh, dual models uh, as we are often um, told. Um, similarly to the fact that there were no two distinct functions, um, the church and the others. This event was uh, a surprising and um, extraordinary event which took place um, in uh, Padua. Galileo had, an in, had great intuitions in relation to the telescope for the purpose of scientific observation and astronomic observations more specifically. First, uh, his uh, observations in uh, Padua were about the moon. And then, uh, as we saw in uh, his um, drawings, uh, came the observations uh, of uh, the satellites uh, of Jupiter in January. As you can see in the exhibition, even if his telescope was uh, certainly higher performing than uh, the contemporary ones, uh, his vision was not that clear cut. Uh, it was not such as to allow Galileo to draw final conclusions. 
This is often the case in uh, scientific experience. Um, nothing happens automatically. There's always uh, the individual in between that runs a certain risk. Uh, Galileo thought there was something to discover and ran the risk. The exhibition also shows that there was a turning point in the life of Galileo and in the history of science. He stopped his studies and started to make continuous observations and also started promoting his discoveries, finding both enemies and supporters in different fields, as we saw. This work by Galileo continued, as Professor Gingrich said, in an attempt to provide further and stronger evidence and proof of his findings. trying to prove the Copernican theory, though he was not able to find the evidence that he wanted to. The exhibition goes on, showing the consequences of the discovery from those years up to now, then concludes by summarizing the basic aspects in um, Galileo's uh, condition as a man and a scientist, uh, between enthusiasm and awareness of his limits, uh, between uh, attempts uh, and uh, also desire to be self-sufficient uh, and independent. At the end, uh, the exhibition uh, well, in the end, the exhibition intends to accompany us uh, to the life of uh, Galileo. We are set in a certain uh, in certain circumstances at the exhibition. Uh, there is continuous wonder and surprise, not only on the part of Galileo, but also on the part of modern scientists. Uh, There is correspondence between the language of mathematics and physical reality, as Galileo also noticed. Benedict the Sixteenth says that correspondence between mathematics and the real structures of the universe generates our admiration and poses a great question, which is unavoidable. Shouldn't there be a unique original or a single original original experience, um, as Professor uh, Gingerich also mentioned in his book? Uh, this is a, a very important question. Uh, I invite you to visit the exhibition. There is a book with the same title of the exhibition, with uh, contributions also by Professor Gingerich and others. There is a guidebook by Eurizes, which uh, shows the main um, attractions of the exhibition. And there are, there's also a publication for schools that you can ask for by applying to Eurizis. Thank you.